When Steel Talks, everybody listens. My guest now is Mr. George Goddard. George Goddard is a name that all pan men do know in the country of Trinidad and Tobago. He's been here for quite some time and he's had a part to play in the development of this musical instrument from way back when. Earlier on we were talking about if we are doing uh, the history of the steel band, the evolution of pan, we've got to go back to the old days. George, would you care to reflect a little on, on what you saw as a young man in the area that you lived? Well, first I'd like to clarify that I did not play any um, part in the development of pan as such. I played a part in the development of the pan men's organization Steel Bands Association and Pan Trimbago and so on. Um, I more or less was, I was given birth in the East Dry River area, what some people refer to as behind the bridge. And at the age of 10, my parents moved to a place called Newtown. We went to live in a place Barksia at 56 Tragweet Road. And this was next to what was called a, the Big Yard or Calvary Yard. They had a name for it, Calvary Yard or the Big Yard, the Big, New, the big Yard in Newtown. It was really made up of a, a few properties, 58 and 60 Tragweet Road, 2, 4, and 6 Woodford Street. So there's about five properties in one, but with no fence separating one from the other. And as we moved to Newtown in 1934, I, as a small boy, coming from behind the bridge or east of the Dry River, where there were a number of Tambu Bambu bands from Rose Hill in the Lavant Hill area, Gonzalez, Heliard in the downtown Port of Spain area, John John. But when I got into Newtown, I don't think that I, I was fortunate to see a Tambu Bambu band in Newtown. I think that I remember as a small boy here seeing and hearing these people beating another type of instrument, not Tambu Bambu. Instruments that was made up of biscuit drums. Biscuit drum at that time was a, a large thin container with a, a diameter of about 20 inches. And other instruments included used paintings and pieces of uh, iron, like motor car, iron, uh, motor car wheel hubs, uh, the hubs of motor car wheels and so on. And this were, these instruments were entirely new to me, as far as I can remember, because I was more or less accustomed to the Tambu Bambu bands in the East Dry River area. Tambu Bambu bands made up of instruments made from bamboo and a bottle that was then known as the gin bottle, um, half full with water, and that was beaten with a tablespoon. Well, this was my, this was my, um, the first experience I, exposure I had with the, uh, as far as the steel band is concerned, and I believe that the steel band got its name at that time not from the, the pans that the men were beating, but it got its name from the the motor car hub that used to be beaten in the band, which was the most noisy instrument in the entire band. Now, um, at that time, the steel band during the preparation for Carnival, or Alex the name of that band was Alexander Ragtime Band, I believe, and I don't think in 1934 it carried the name Alexander Ragtime Band because I believe the motion picture by the same name was not released until quite a few years after 1934. 
I think in 1934, when I was a small boy and heard the band for the first time, the band was perhaps called the Newtown Boys Band, since it was a band made up of young men, not boys, although it was called Newtown Boys Band, a band made up of young men, the majority of them over 20 years of age, some in the 30s and, and one or two here and there in the 40s and perhaps early 50s. So the, steel, the Alexander Ragtime Band was an entirely different type of steel band to what we find today with a lot of children beating pan and participating. Because in the early days, adults never really encouraged children to be around them, especially nothing like a steel band that would have people behaving at times in a manner that will not be the best type of display for children to see or hear and so on. What was the the city like? What was Port of Spain like? Um, the, the the atmosphere. I mean, uh, was it busy or what was it like? Well, I could, Port of Spain. I I could not say what uptown Port of Spain was like at the time because, in spite of the fact that we only live about one mile from the center of Port of Spain in Newtown, we still a small town. My age. In my age group at that time, we'll hardly have any reason to go into uptown Port of Spain. But I can tell you what Newtown was like, especially the Big Yard. Newtown was, a, was a, sm a very small district. I think it's the very smallest district in Trinidad. But it was made up of different types of people. You had the well-to-do that were living in some of the very biggest houses that you could find in Trinidad up to now. You had the not so well to do that live in a type of uh, apartment houses. And then you had the very poor, like the family from which I came, who lived in a number of barracks yards in Newtown, in, in the streets in Newtown, like Woodford Street, Picton Street, Marval Road, Cipriani Boulevard, Warner Street, and so on. You'll find a number of barracks yards with poor people living in these barracks here. I was one of the unfortunate ones to come from that setting from behind the bridge and continue to live in that setting in Newtown. Now what took place in the Big Yard? The Big Yard was more or less used during the, the morning an early afternoon period of the day. You will find a lot of young men and at times women participating in different types of gambling games like what the Americans might, would call dice or what they call dice today but it was referred to at that time as Sebi Levy. I think Sebi Levy means 7 and 11. Some of them would be playing a game that is I think it is now called Bingo, but at that time I believe it was called Ice Down. Some would be playing Rumi, All Fools, Wapi, which is another card game. And a number of different games you find they will be occupying themselves when, with during the course of the day. The early part of the, 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 the forenoon period and the early afternoon period. But in the late afternoon period from about 4 o'clock when a lot of people had returned to their homes from work and so on. Because at that time, most people were very near to where they lived. So around four o'clock, the majority of people, especially those in the barracks, they had, will return to their homes from their work. And this is the time that the steel band action will take, will start. And more so during the carnival season, which was the period following New Year's up to carnival Monday, on Tuesday. On afternoons, they were gathered and started to beat their pan. And a number of stick players will come from all different districts, from as far as Sangri Grandi, the Deep South, St. James, Uptown Port of Spain. All these stick players would assemble in the big yard to play the game that we call stick to the accompaniment of the music as supplied by the steel band. But the steel band at that time was, was just like the tambu bamboo band that was before it. 
It was a band that only supplied rhythm, tempo and rhythm. The melodies had to be supplied, had to be supplied by the voices of the people who would sing different types of songs that were suitable to the rhythm that the steel band would have been playing to accommodate the stick fighters and so on. Songs like Who's My Friend Who Come In The Ring, 10,000 To Bar Me One, and Berry Buller For Me, and these type of songs, you know. So that was the type of activities you would have in the big, big yard where in Newtown where you will find these, 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 these people involved in pan beating in the Newtown Boys Band. Now, now unlike the, the, the members of a steel band today, the members of the Newtown Boys steel band was a different type of... When Steel Talks, everybody listens. ...person to what you'll find in the regular steel band today. For example, in a steel band today, you will find children, small children, 13, 14, 15 years of age, taking an active part. It was not so an Alexander Ragtime band. All of the players, more or less, were big men. I don't think they had any under the age of 21. Quite a few would be in the 20s. The majority would be in the 30s. Some would be in the 40s. And you'll find the odd one here and there, even in the 50s. Now, these were big men who... Some were painters, house painters. Some would be... Painters painting houses and so on. Some would be grooms. A few of them are still alive today. Some were grooms that were in the paddock at the Queen's Park Savannah, attending to the racehorses and so on, attending to some of the racehorses. Feel free to call names that you right. recollect. Oh, well, one of the old timers who was more or less the un. What do you have to call him? He more or less was regarded as the leader of the band because he was the most level headed, the most. Um, he was the big favorite in the band. He's still alive. He's about. He's a man in his 70s today. He can still be found at the paddock as a groom. I don't, never knew what his correct name was. I don't know. He's, no, he's, he's called Freddy Maroon. He is still, at the, he is still there at the, um, at the paddock in the Queen's Park, Savannah. There's the next one by the name of K-Pax. He is a groom still. Very, I don't know where to find him now apart from at his home up somewhere in the Simeon Road by West Parallel. You have one that is still alive too, again, that was an active beaten Alexander Ragtime Band. As a matter of fact, I have all reason to believe that he's the one who gave the name Ping Pong to this, the instrument in the steel band. He's Victor Wilson, who is also called Toti, or Bembo. And he lives at present at 45 Cipriani Boulevard in Newtown still. He never came out of Newtown. You have one lives somewhere in the Waterhole area, but it's called Police. He's is, is rated as one of the... Uh, Best boom men, biscuit drum beaters at that time. Uh, there might be quite a few around whose name I really can't remember now. But coming back to it now, some of these men were grungs men at the Queen's Park Savannah, taking care of things like cricket pitches in the cricket season and taking, um, taking care of the football grungs in, um, in the football season. Quite a few of these people were grungs men. Um, some were, I believe, were wharf workers. Some were wayway markers. I don't know if, it, what is, what, if you know what they, they call a wayway marker. I think the, it's called numbers in the United States of America. But in Trinidad, we have a game similar to it that is called wayway. And quite a few men at that time in Newtown made a living out of taking up these marks to play on behalf of people who would punt and so on. So you see, that was the type of person that you had in Alexander Rock Time Band. Now, today you would find in a steel band Persons from the professional field, persons from the public service, uh, school teachers, and so on, you'll find that in the steel band today. It was not so an Alexander Ragtime band. It was more or less a band of people who more or less would, would be, be really underprivileged and very poor like the family that I came from. But this is the way that the Alexander Ragtime band was made up. George, I'd like to move up a little more current um, because I know you want to go and take a look at the panorama. Uh, could you give me your role in, in the organization of, of PAN, the PAN Trinbago Movement, the Steel Band Organization, when you started and, you know, things like that? 
Well, I never became actively involved in steel band as a beater until after the death of my my mother in 1939. I would be more or less, it would be about perhaps the early part of 1940 that I would be actually, that I would have become actually involved in a steel band because I, I couldn't go around a steel band when my father was alive. He died in 1937. And then my mother, mother was a little bit more strict than my father, so I had to keep away. And then again, the big men would not have encouraged small boys to be around them, and it was another problem. So it was not until about 1940 that I, at the age of 16, started to move in a little bit into Alexander Ragtime Band. Anyhow, by 1946, after when we, we, we started to have carnival again, when we first started to have carnival again, there was no, um, we could no longer beat in the big yard because the people were given notice, were given notice to come out of the, the big yard for the houses to be broken down to build up a bank. A bank is there now, Barclays Bank is there now. So not having any yard to beat in in 1946, I was living at 24 Picton Street at that time. I decided to bring out Alexander Rock Time Band from, the, from my yard, the yard I was living in Picton Street. So we came out in 1946. But we changed the name in 1946 from Alexander Rock Time Band because by that time, quite a few bands had come on the scene with a kind of little war names and so on, like Invaders and Tokyo and Desperados and so on. So as young boys, we felt the name in um, Alexander Rock Time Band was a little bit too soft. So we decided to change the name to Kong Basie on the Carnival Monday and Construction Battalion CB on the Carnival Tuesday. However, by that time, all of the young, the youth from Newtown was more interested in playing with Invaders because Invaders were the band that came on the scene in 1941 as Oval Boys. And they built up a very nice reputation with young people from Newtown and Woodbrook during the, the period that we had no Carnival. So by 1946, very few of the youths were prepared or willing to, to continue playing in the band from Newtown. They more before to go down with invaders because they had much better beaters than invaders and quite a number of young people like themselves and so on. So I joined forces with invaders in 1947. After joining forces with invaders in 1947, the big bacchanals started, the big steel band bacchanals started, where steel bands started to ride with one another. Invaders became involved in a, in, in a number of these, these clashes. Then they, they reached a stage where the police and the probation officer and so on came on the scene. The chief probation officer was then a gentleman who is now deceased, Mr. George Moles. And Ellie Manet asked um, a few of us to go and represented um, invaders at these peace talks. What was his reason? I don't know. He asked, he asked the chap who is now deceased, who was the secretary of invaders at that time, Clarence Gulston. I think he asked Lloyd Wright, who is now with Starley, and Francis Wickham, who is still with invaders now, and I, and myself, to go and represent invaders at these, these, these peace talks and so on. But the peace talks were so successful that we decided since everything had worked out well, to form a steel bands association. That was about 1949. I formed the steel bands association, and I was elected at that very first meeting uh, as assistant secretary. A chap by the name of Sidney Gollop from Crusaders, he was elected as president. Nathaniel Kuchlo, who is now the president of the National Union of Government and Federated Workers, he was representing city syncopators at the time. He was elected vice president. A fellow called Sonny Harewood, who was a public health inspector, he's now on dude. He was elected general secretary. I, representing invaders, assistant secretary. A chapter called Carlton Beattie, who then represented a band. He's also with the special work people now, dude. He was representing Rising Sun from Belmont. He was elected treasurer. And quite Oscar Pyle and I think Wilfred Harrison from Death Brothers were elected to serve on the, on the committee. However, I did not stop in the steel band association for too long, and perhaps there about a year, and then I left and I went down south. And I never returned until somewhere around 1955, I think it was. And I started to attend the steel band association meeting again, but I was not elected in 1955. 
It was not until 1957 that the, the members of the Casablanca Steel Manager by the name of Baron Arieta, Oscar Pyle, Baron Arieta is now in Venezuela, Oscar Pyle is still alive, he is the founder of Casablanca Steel Band. A chap who is now dead from Casablanca by the name of Zoe, they asked me, and the leader of, the then leader of Casablanca, Laurie Miller, they all asked me to represent Casablanca at the Steel Bands Association meeting because they felt that I would have made a good president and they wanted me to be the leader of the Steel Bands Association. Well, I went and I attended the, the convention and I was elected president in 1957. I was re-elected in 1958 and I was re-elected in 1959. But I resigned in 1959 and I went down into the South. I never returned until 1962. In 1962, I came back and I was elected again in September of 1962 as president. I was elected in 63, 64, 65, 66, 68, 70. I resigned in 1971. Then Pan Trimbego came on the scene. I went back, I attended the first meeting of Pan Trimbego in 1974, first convention in 1974, and in 1974 I was elected at that convention as treasurer of Pan Trimbego. I was not satisfied with the way the finances were looking, and in, in an effort not to involve myself, I did not stop very long. As I just made out a financial statement to the membership, pointing out to them the the financial irregularities I'd seen, told them I could not be involved, so I resigned as treasurer. Then I went back again, the second meeting, I went back a second time in 1978, 70, 70, 77, I was elected as public relations officer. I stayed some time as public relations officer, then I resigned. And I was elected in 1978, December 1978, as president of Pantry Mago. I resigned in June of 1979. But this is the, these are the, the, the executive positions I held in the Steve Bar movement. But the, greatest thing, the, the, the best thing I believe that I had done during my term of office in the Steve Bar movement is when I had organized a national Steve Band. The opportunities that were coming in train at the time were so few. When still talks, everybody would, would have taken a long time before a number of steel bands would have gotten any opportunity to go overseas and travel and so on. So I felt the best thing that we could have, best thing we could have done to, was to form a national steel band. At that time, we only had 44 bands in the steel band association. So I decided that we would form a national steel band with, the 40, with one member from each of the 44 bands. So it would mean that if an opportunity came that a steel band should represent Trinidad and Tobago abroad, or any opportunity came to so that the steel bands can make some dollars, at least one member from each band would have had an opportunity to benefit from that type of project. And we organized the national steel band in 1963. And this played an important role in getting a type of relationship ex established between st the steel bands men from that 44 steel bands that made up the national steel band that we hadn't before. There was a type of a, a relationship that developed that it is still there up to today in spite of the fact that the national steel band is no longer in existence as from 1970 or somewhere around that time. This, I think, was the was one of the best things that happened on the steel band scene because people who normally kept on wrangling with one another, in spite of the fact that they were members in the organization, in the same organization, became more closer together and was in a position to quell at the, in, in the shortest space of time any misunderstanding that might have developed between the members of this one band and another band. This is one of this is, this is this in my opinion is one of the um, the outstanding things I believe that I did on the steel band scene. Of course I am the I had the honor to to organize 
most of the steel band festivals that we've had. Now, some people seem to think that that the steel bands that took part in the festival that was won by Boy Song in 1952, I think it was, by Southern All Stars in 54, by Cats and Jammers in 56, I think by Dixieland in 62. Some people seem to think that these were steel band festivals. But these were not steel band festivals. They, these were steel band classes in the Trinidad and Tobago Music Festival. The very first steel band festival we had was an independent steel band festival in 1963. This was run by Crossfire that is no longer in our, um, operation. Now, during the festival finals, the Trinidad Tobago Music Festival finals of the steel band class in 1962, a misunderstanding developed at Queen's Hall. Involved in that misunderstanding was Ellie Manette, Tony Williams, George Yates, and quite a few leaders of steel bands that had gotten into the finals or had, that had participated in the, in the steel band class of the music festival in 1962. After that misunderstanding was settled 90 minutes after, causing the show to start 90 minutes late, the Music Association decided that they would have no further dealing with the steel band. And as a result, there would be no steel band class in the music festival. In those days, the Steel Bands Association organized the preliminaries, the quarterfinals, and the semifinals, from which they eventually took out eight bands. And the foreign adjudicators that came down to adjudicate at the music festival would adjudicate the eight bands that came out of the preliminaries, quarterfinals, and semifinals. So they decided that they will have no further dealing with the steel bands because of the misunderstanding that developed at Queen's Hall in 1962. What was the real purpose or what caused the misunderstanding, I could not say. Eddie Manet and them would be in a much better position to say than I can say, because I was not there, I was at home. So they informed us after that it was not going to include a steel band class in their festival. So I approached the, the, the then Prime Minister, who is now deceased, Dr. Williams. And I told him that the Music Association did not want the steel bands any longer in the festival. And I felt that the steel bands men should show the Music Association that they can run their own festival just as successful, if not more successful, than the Music Association. I said, however, they refused to get turn over the trophies to us because at that time the steel bands used to compete for a big, big trophy they called the Hope Ross Trophy, one of the biggest trophies we ever had in Trinidad. They refused to give us that trophy. So the Prime Minister says, said he was in full agreement with us and he would um, give us a trophy for the festival. So he gave us a trophy for the festival. However, we had to get a trophy also for the ping pong solvest part. And we approached the then Governor General, Sir Solomon O'Troy, for a trophy for the semi finals and he gave us a trophy for the a trophy for the ping pong solvest and he gave us a trophy for the ping pong solvest. So we held that first festival in 19... That's the first time that we had a steel band festival with the same adjudicators adjudicating from preliminary to final. And the first time that you had a festival that could be called a steel band festival. We had a... We repeated this festival, but for different trophies in 1964. And we continued holding festivals in 1965, 66, 67 up to 1968 and all the festivals that were held between 1963 and 1968 they were even much more successful um, than all the festivals I had before that because the one in 1966 that was won by Panam North Stars it is believed it is the belief of many people that the standards of a festival never before got to that height, nor since has gotten to that height. As a matter of fact, Tony Williams is regarded today as being the greatest individual steel man ever. 
because of what he did at that festival in 1966. These are some of the festival, the panorama. We we also started the panorama as from 1963. Of course, it was an entirely different show than what they have today. They take the panorama from what it what it was in 1963 and they turn it into something else in nine, by in, in 1982. The purpose, purpose of the panorama when we started panorama. Before Panama, we started another show at the Savannah, similar to Panama, but under a different name, Steel Band Bacchanal, in 1959. 50, 58. Now, Steel Band's men and their supporters, they, they're always arguing that this band from the south is better from this band in the north, and this band from the east is better from this band in the west, at carnival times. But no one could no one was in a position to say which band really was better than the next one musically because the bands from the south could not meet the bands from the north on Carnival Day. Neither could the bands in the east meet the bands in the west on Carnival Day. So we decided to have a Carnival program, a Carnival competition, just as the bands will beat on the streets for Carnival Monday and Tuesday. We decided to have a Carnival along those lines. But before Carnival, in an effort to bring in all of the bands, from the east, the south, Tobago, and so on. Because if we had done, tried to do it on Carnival Monday and Tuesday, it would mean destroying the Carnival in these, these areas. So we had to do it before Carnival. So we go to this Fana with these steel bands from the east, the south, the north, and so on on a Sunday. And they will beat as they will beat on the street. There's a Carnival display. They beat as they will beat on the street. We'll have the judges from the top of the competition in Frederick Street, and they will come, we'll have a number of judges going right through the place until they reach the end to come out by, by um, after the stage. So the steel bands will continue beating right across as they will beat on the street Carnival Monday and Tuesday. They will not stop on stage and turn facing the judges on one side and turn their back to the audience on the other side. But today, Panama has taken a, 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 a type of... They have a type of presentation now that one would expect to find on a stage at Queen's Hall and not at the Savannah... Um, for Carnival program and so on. But this too has been a very successful program because it's, it's, been, it's, develop, it's been developing more and more and more every year. I think, it is, I think it is a much better program than even Carnival Monday and Tuesday. I think the Steel Band Panorama today attracts more people at the Queen's Park Savannah than any other aspect of Carnival. I don't think there's any aspect of Carnival that you can attract more people at the Queen's Park Savannah than what you attract for the... Um, the steel band panorama. Well, these are some of these are some of the some of the things I got myself involved in. In the, of course, I've had to settle quite a number of misunderstandings between this band and the next band, which is, was not a very easy job. But steel bands men are, in spite of what people might think about steel bands men, they are people that are very easy to get along with, as long as you try to be straightforward with them and be honest with them and be truthful with them. You don't have any problem. As a matter of fact, I've been involved in the steel band movement for many years, and I've never been disrespected as much as once by any steel bandsman. No steel bandsman has ever yet as much as one disrespected me. As a matter of fact, wherever I pass, they always go out of their way to make me feel comfortable. Of course, if a fellow take part in a competition and he doesn't win, he will always feel that you, somebody, is the cause of him not winning. You understand? You say, all right, God, that boy, you rob me to stay and things that you saw, but you don't, but you don't go any further than that. Why, why is there the controversy of judges um, with Panorama and so on? Well, it is the, a, a steel band Panorama is not a very easy thing to judge, especially at the preliminaries, the preliminary stages. Because for a panel of five people to sit down, and listen, on one day or two days or over a period of three days, the 70 or 80 steel bands performing and arrive at decisions without there being controversies and protests and objections, I think this would be expecting too much of simple people, expecting too much of human. 
Do you feel that they, the, another system could be introduced, perhaps by elimination, by judges going to pan yards, pan theaters, or so? Well, I don't. I don't think that judges going to pan yard and judging could give. I don't think you can assess a steel, as, uh, the steel bands that way because a competi- every, every participant in the competition should participate under the same terms and conditions. And you, to go from panyard to panyard one night after the next night and so on, you're going to find yourself hearing a st- one steel band playing under ideal conditions, good acoustics, good weather condition and you're going to find yourself here another steel band playing under terrible conditions, bad acoustics and so on. You yourself as a human most only will not find yourself being in the same frame of mind on Friday as you probably as the frame of mind you probably was in on Monday. So I don't think that would be a good system at all. I don't think I don't think we can we're going to find any system by which, the, that, by which we can judge a steel band panorama. And at the end, not find people complaining and protesting and objecting. What we did in 1967. In 1967, we, in the Steel Band Association, came to the conclusion that a number of bands performed, and the general public supported the performance of some of these bands, only to find that when the judges gave the decision, the band that the general public felt played in an outstanding, um, given outstanding performance, were not selected by the judges. So, what we did in 1967, we picked a panel of judges to pick out the amount of bands we required for the semi-finals. But all of the people who got to the venue of the preliminaries before the first band played on the morning of the preliminaries, we gave them a ballot paper. And as the last band started to play the evening on the, at the preliminaries, we put in position ballot boxes. So we told the judges to pick out the bands that they felt had played good enough to be in the semi-finals. And we asked the members of the public who were there before the first band started to play and who probably stayed back after the, until the last band played to put down the bands that they feel qualified. I think it was, we told the judges to pick your 16. We told the people to pick their 16. I think this, is, this was, it was under this was under the system that Tokyo, for the first time, got into a semi-finals. And Tokyo is a band that the people always felt was an outstanding band at Panorama. But the judges just would not pick Tokyo, never, never would pick them, in spite of the fact that it was the feeling of the people that they, they, were, they were played very well and so on. I think, this, I think if I'm not mistaken, so Ramanais could be one of the bands that got, probably got in that way the first time too. Mm-hmm. So when it ended, we found ourselves with about 18 or 19 bands. The people and the judges agreed on about 12 bands. You understand? The difference was only by two or three bands different. So what we did, we took those, all the bands into the semifinals. I think it was 19 or 20 bands. Now, the point is this, that if the judges don't pick you and the people don't pick you, there's no, no, no complaint you can make. You see? We, 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 we never said it was 100% foolproof, but we had no objections that year. We had no criticism that year because the judges did not pick you, the people did not pick you. You can't pick yourself. Now, I am inclined to think that this will be a much better system than depending on five or six or seven people to judge. It is unfair to the people too. To make a person sit down 12 or 14 or 20 hours you take, for example, what took place for this year's panorama. You take an aged man like Major Watson, who's already retired from the armed forces. A retired man, but a man who's prepared to make a contribution to the steel bands. He's always 
He's always prepared to make a contribution to the steel band. He's one of the oldest adjudicators in steel band competition in Trinidad and Tobago, Major Watson. He's a man for whom I have the greatest respect. But this man is taken to a room about 5 o'clock the evening, and he sits in a room until half past 5 the following morning judging a steel band panorama. To leave a room to come down into Blue Range, to get back to the Queen's Park Savannah for half past 9 in the morning to judge another, another competition. I mean to say, is a, is a human you're talking about? How, 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 how well can he judge under this condition? How well can he judge under this condition? It's not easy for him. He must, it's only natural that he'll make a mistake. Now, if a judge makes a mistake, and the mistake is not in the interest of a, a, a one of the contestants, the contestant, in my opinion, is very well right to take objection. Because this, this, you talk, if you make a mistake, I must not suffer as a result of the mistake you make. You see, but we got to find a better system for judging. You don't have a competition and tell people we have five judges and the decision of the judges, whatever decision the judges give, that decision is final. You don't do it when you're dealing with an organization. When you're dealing with an organization, the judges take a decision and there's protest. You have to take the protest and the objection back to the membership of the organization and let the membership decide as to what would be the best thing to do in the best interest of the competition and in the best interest of the organization. All the excitement that took place this year before the High Court and so on, I'm quite certain if I was wrong, it could not have gotten to the High Court and everybody would have been satisfied after um, with the decisions taken as to what should be done or what should not be done as far as the Panama is concerned. Um, there's no need to reach, to, to reach before the High Court on a, on a matter like that. It could have been settled outside of the High Court. I don't see why we should think in terms of settling any matter in which the bands are involved in this day, day and age. Why we should depend on the High Court to settle it, especially when the steel bands have an organization such as Pan Trinbago and so on, who should be representing the, the interests of the steel bands and so on. When steel talks, everybody listens. Um, but I don't think we can do I don't think it is going to be easy. Some people say to find out that we should use a computer. I, as one person suggests a computer, as a matter of fact, I think this was Rudolf Charles's um, suggestion a few years ago that we should use a computer. I see a um, booty marshal come back this year and talk about computer. But what kind of computer? You see, what kind of computer? To judge the, the, judge the competition. To judge the competition. I don't know what they mean by computer. You see, I don't know how, they, how they're going to go about doing this. But I think the best thing to do would be to let the people who pay the money decide. I think, I think, I think, Trinidad, I think the Tr Trinidadians are, are honest people. And you know who I prove Trinidadians to be honest people? You take the case of Desperados. Go to the Savannah to play in the finals. And they're very unpopular with, with, the, with the crowd because of the court scene that the, court, the, the, the population, some members of the population felt they should not be involved in. I don't share that view. I think what Desperados did, it was right to do, because they had no other choice. But they go to a competition, and people start to boo them before they start to beat, and start to boo them even after they start beating. But Trinidad people, in my opinion, they're such, they're, they're so, so broad-minded and fair, that as soon as they were satisfied that Desperados was given a good display, they stopped the booing, and the same people who was behind me booing and heckling Desperados turned out to be some of the, the longest of, of people applauding the performance of Des Desperados. So I feel that if you let the people decide, regardless of their personal feelings, I believe that if a person is the supporter of A band, and they, in their hearts of hearts they're satisfied that B band won, I believe they're going to give, the, 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 give it to B band. I believe this is the type of people they have. I think they're going to be, I think all people are fair people in, in, in that respect. But they'll have to find some system. George, I've got to thank you for really giving me this time to discuss the, the pan, uh, your role in it, especially. 
and uh, go back a little. Uh, there's a, I, could, I could sit here for two, three hours and just talk with you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but what I um, wanted to, to also get a little taste or a little flavor of, you know, the technique that you used in, in dealing with the different steel bands, I mean, uh, as within your different roles, within your negotiating and so on, how did you? How were you able to to work with a man from Casablanca and a man from Tokyo or, or something like that? Well, the first thing one has got to do if, when one is involved in the steel bat is not to take sides, and you must be honest, you must be truthful, you must be frank. I believe as long as you find yourself. In a position that steel bands men believe that when you say yes, you mean yes. I don't think you're going to have any problems again with, at all with them. I think, and I can always take a decision. I, I've taken decisions at times against some steel bands, as I had to take a decision against Solo Harmonizer a few years ago, when they refused to beat in the order in which it should be. And they still qualify, the judges still qualify them for the semi finals. But I was appointed to solar harmonize because of my position in the steel bar movement. I had to disqualify them for taking further part in the competition. What was the reaction? Well, they were, they were not too pleased about it, but I told them plainly that I have to think in terms of saving the organization. You did not play in the order in which you, should, you, you were required to play. You called upon quite a few times. You did not play. The judges select you, yes, but you will say that. So, however, but this is one thing I always point out to the department. You have the rights to appeal to a general member's meeting. And whatever decision the general members take is all right with me. Yeah. You see, I, I didn't suspend solo harmonites because I have something against solo harmonites. I had to suspend, suspend solo harmonites because I would have found myself in a difficult position had I allowed solo harmonites to go into the semifinals, breaking the, willfully breaking the rules, going into the semifinals without I taking any action against them. Well, I, they took it to the appeal to a joint membership meeting, and the joint member said that they should, take, should be allowed to take part in the semifinals. Of course, they, did not, they, they spoke to them very roughly about the behavior and so on. Um, I had to take a decision against, at one time I had to take a decision against Silver Stars. I had to take a decision against Invaders, I was a band that I came from. I had to take a decision against um, Tokyo. But I will always... Tell them they will always know that they have a right, the rights to appeal to the joint membership, and I will be the first one to call a joint membership meeting. Understand that? And when I will just give the reason why I took action. I don't press the matter because I have not no personal in, um, interest. I just have to take a, take whatever action I believe will serve in the best interest of, of the organization. Now, in a case like this, this is what I would have done in this situation here. I would have going to I was going to call a joint members meeting. Let Desperados and Tokyo and Valley Harps and, and, and Jewel explain to the members what happened. The members will decide. You see, they'll decide and say whether or not they should, they should be allowed to take part. And we don't have to go, to, we don't have to go before the High Court. Because if the general membership say they shouldn't take part, and they decide to take, go before the High Court, they'll be taking High Court action against their own organization. But the general membership don't, don't usually take a decision that a band should not be allowed to take part. You see, they usually take, take a decision to allow the band to take part. They would have taken part without I losing any face. I didn't lose any face in the case of solo harmonize. I did what I had was to do. When the general membership said that they should participate, it doesn't bother me because I have nothing against solo harmonize. I have nothing against Tokyo. I have nothing against invaders. I, have not, I am not for any band. I am not against any band. I am there. You put me there to, to, to run the organization. I'm going to run it to the best of my ability without taking size, without getting myself involved in any, 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 any personality clash. A fellow, if a fellow got, a, a chap don't have to agree with me, he could disagree with me. You understand that is his business, that is his privilege. I don't say because he disagrees with me, he, sh he should shut up. And the one who agrees with me should be allowed to speak. As a matter of fact, the one who disagrees with me, I give him more privilege to speak than the one who agrees with me. You see? And I think as long as you, you, as long as you, you operate with steel bands, men that way, they will have, they will have some like this field. I can't complain about steel, I can't complain about steel bands, men at all. If I had my life to live over, I will live it the same way again between steel bands, men. I will act, 
every decision I took in the past, if I had to do it, I'd take the same decisions again. You see. Um, another question I wanted to throw out to you. Let's go back a little into the past, in the old days, the Red Army days. I understand Red Army was the first band that traveled outside of Trinidad, uh, even before Brute Force went out other places out of Antigua. Do you remember this to be fact? Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with this because Red Army is the very first band that I think that I knew went on tour, and I think Invaders followed this soon up after. Soon after, because I think my my, make, my makers might have gone to Ghana around 1947, and the invaders might have gone to Aruba a little after that in 1947 or 1948. But I think my makers is the very first band to go on tour um, under the leadership of um, I think Dago. Dago is the leader of the band. He's in he's in England now. As a matter of fact. My makers had the reputation of being the very best dressed steel band in the... There's no steel band before Red Army, during Red Army period, or after Red Army that was better, had better dressed men than Red Army. Red Army is the best dressed steel band that we ever had in Trinidad and Tobago. Again, this was a band mainly of, 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 grow, of grown up, grown up men, big men, men in the, in the 20s and 30s and so on. The King Sales and Dago and... I think Mas I think Masti at one time Masti was in it. Um the My Fan brothers, Carlton and, and Kenwick. Um Chun. My, my makers was um, my makers I think is the first band ever to go on tour. And they could have afforded it too, you see, because my makers is a band, although it was given birth in New Tongue, but soon after it was given birth in New Tongue, the tongue sec the, the tongue sector in many years ago a number of people from Uptown used to play in Alexander Ragtime Band. Mm -hmm. So they continued playing in Alexander Ragtime Band up to VJ. Alexander Ragtime Band changed its name for VJ into to, to Red Army. Right? They changed oh, so it. Alexander Ragtime Band changed its name, became Red Army? But Alexander Ragtime Band for the victory in Europe, B, changed right. the name to Red and White Russians for that day. And then for BJ, they changed the name again to Red Army. Not that they changed the name, they played Red Army. Right. You see, it's not, that, it's not that they changed the name, they played Red Army. For V, they played Red and White Russians as soon as the war was finished in Europe. They gave us a little carnival, so we played Red and White Russians. Then BJ came a few months later, and they, changed, they we played a mass again, Russians. You understand that? Red Army. They would rather say that it was Alexander Ragtime Band playing Red Army. So what happened, a misunderstanding developed in, in Alexander Ragtime Band for VJ. The tongue people, the tongue section wanted to do certain things. The new tongue sector did not want them to do, do that. And the little cold war continued. And the fellas from uptown decided in 1947, for the first the carnival in 19, the carnival in 1946, to bring out their own Red Army. So they brought out their own Red Army from uptown under the leadership of a chap they called Dago. You see? Mm -hmm. Now, it the the unlike Alexander Ragtime Band. Whose members were mainly grooms and gongsmen and wave markers and perhaps painters and wharf workers and so on. A number of the chaps in Red Army were what you call, they call them sweet men, living with prostitutes, prostitutes minding them. So they were in a much better position than the Newton side. They could, they could buy plenty better clothes than the Newton side because of the type of life that they live in. They live in women, bad, um, women mining them and giving them money and so on. So they could have much better clothes than the chaps in, in Newton who would be grounds men and so on. So, they dis so this put, this put a, di a different perspective, perhaps the role of women in pan, where the women were, were actually taking care of the pan men. And um, could it possibly be a reason for some of the fights too from steel bands when one fellow perhaps from hell dead end kids was going with a girl from Red Army, a girl, you know, who belonged to a guy from Red Army, and while going on the road, they, meet, they might have clashed. Is that possible? Yeah, but most of the steel band clashes started because of women, and these type of women too. That's a, that's, that is a fact. Most of the riots, as, as many of them in which invaders were, in, were involved with other people. As a matter of fact, there were two, two characters. I will not call the names though. One is dead, and one is still beating band in England. One was from the Casablanca, and the next one was some invaders. Of course, he was not really an invader pan beater. He was an invader pan beater during the days when invaders were still beating biscuit drum. But after invaders started developing pans and so on, he did not continue beating pan. He was just one of the 
the, the, the live members and invaders who will always be invaders and fight for invaders, I think will be sought. Now, both of them with one, one, one woman, one red woman. She's still alive. She lives at Lansmeter now. Both of them was with one woman. So when she's in Woodbrook, she's with, she's with the, the, the Woodbrook man. She lives with the Woodbrook man. And when the, tongue, the, the man from Casablanca says, he picks up his car back up in Bath Street. And they, they, they kept on fighting. I don't, they kept on fighting for years. They kept, uh, they kept, uh, as a matter of fact, you call the name. This is Carlton Blackhead and Ziggly <laughs> fighting over a girl they call Little One. Now, you, you, what happened now is that if Carlton Blackhead is being beaten by Ziggly in the presence of Ziggly friends, and Ziggly is from behind the bridge, Ziggly friends is going to help Peter beat Carlton Blackhead. As a matter of fact, Carlton Blackhead was beaten or no fewer than, than, than Ellie, will, Ellie might be able to confirm this, no fewer than a dozen times by Ziggly and his, and his boys from behind the bridge. And when Ziggly, when Ziggly now um, is seen outside in Woodbrook or anything in the Woodbrook area, well, back and I will start. And the riots will start, and big, big riots will start too. And a number of riots, the majority of riots in Stilvan started two women. One or two might have started because of um, Stilvan results, um, competition results and so on, before it was organized, you know. Like the little competition that they would, they would have North South or the little competition at the Mukwapo Stadium with parts steel bands compete against one another and so on. But most of the fights in steel bands started be, um, through women. And the women actually used to fan the flames. They used to look for it. There were a lot of women, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of women was involved in steel band, in steel band clashes. The, at one time, a number of the invader boys went in town in St. Vincent Street, right where that... Uh, Right where that theater is built now in St. Vincent Street. Globe. Not at Globe. National. That's new theater in St. Vincent Street on the Vistarama. Vistarama. A number of invaders men who at one time was living in a house, an upstairs house, there with a, a, a number of um, street girls from town. A number of them, I wouldn't call the names though because I, wouldn't, it, it, I wouldn't, want, wouldn't want to embarrass them and so on. And this, is, this has been the pattern. Now, still, uh, still uh, the, early, the earliest, not, not, as a matter of fact, even a number of the, the old members in Alexander were time ban. While some of them did not depend mainly on women mining them, and while the women in Newtown, some of the women in Newtown that mined these men were not perhaps the type of women that you would have found in George Street and Nelson Street and, uh, on, on, the, on, on the one hand. On the other hand, quite a few women in Newton used to mind quite a few men from Newton Band. Quite a few of them used to mind them. Mind them. Yeah. You see? Of course, the men at times will have to go and look for a little hard work, you know, but most of the time they're, they're, they're women minding them. George, finally... Um Doing evolution upon history the steel ban, what would you recommend or ensure us that we do? What would you like to see included in, in, in the documentation of this? Uh, what would you like to see come out of all of this? The first thing I would like to see, as a matter of fact, I've, asked, I've been asking government to do this for quite a number of years. I've been asking Dr. Williams to do this. I've asked Dr. Williams to, I asked Dr. Williams to do this when he was alive. I wrote him quite a few times about it. Well, before you answer that question, I also would like you to remark on Dr. Dr. Williams' reaction to Pan, his role in Pan. I think that Dr. Williams was interested in the the welfare of pan men and the progress of pan. But I think that he perhaps was so advised by the people he had around him that he perhaps can considered as being authorities on, 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 on the subject, that he did not do what he perhaps should have done, in spite of the fact that I, I have always reason to believe 
that he was he very much like Steel Bands and Steel Bands men. I have that that personal feeling. Now I should have mentioned this. I was appointed as advisor to Dr. Williams on the improvement of steel bands in 1969. And I tried to give him advice from time to time. He had me attached to the community development. And he set up a committee to make recommendations as to what should be done for the steel band. So that committee was on the, the chairmanship of Max Coffey. And I think to the thing, Tony Williams, Prospect, and one or two people was on that committee. I was a member of that committee too. But Dr. Williams was the type of person who would set up a committee and would tell you to tell the committee what he wanted the committee to do. And this is what he tried to do with me. So I told Max Coffey from the very beginning, I don't think we was going to get any place with the recommendations because Doc Williams wanted us to do certain things. And Max Coffey indicated that he couldn't care less whether he, he accepted the recommendation or not he was going to head with the, the assignment he was given. But when I, tr when I tried to advise Dr. Williams as to what should be done about the steel bands, he apparently was advised by other people and he did not accept my advice at all. As a matter of fact, seeing that he didn't do anything for the steel bands, it seemed as though he didn't accept anybody's advice at all. Because the first thing that Dr. Williams allowed himself to be influenced into doing for steel bands was to say, set up a training course to teach steel bands men business administration. Five weeks training course in teaching steel bands men business administration. And I kept on trying to explain to Dr. Williams what steel bands men wanted was not training course in business, business administration. What steel bands men wanted was opportunity to earn, to earn out of pan beating or pan tuning or pan playing and things of the sort. But he was the type of person that was a power in the true sense of the word, that he couldn't care less what I say or what I didn't say until we, we eventually crossed out in 1970. And that was the end of the, uh, because he would not take advice. I advised Dr. Williams to set up a steel band research council using as the base and Tony Williams, Ellie Manet, and Bertie Marshall. I told him Ellie Manet because Ellie Manet pants, styling of pants was more accepted than the styling of pants by any other tuna in Trinidad and Tobago. Tony Williams, because it was said that his arrangement of notes, places of notes on the instrument was the very best and nearest to the notes placed on a piano and he was the most successful at festivals and panorama. His music was, cons the music he, he played was always regarded as being the very best. Bertie Marshall because he was doing experiments on electronics and I felt that electronics would have had to play an important role at some time or another on the, on the steel band scene because people would not have been in a position to accommodate big steel bands and perhaps with electronics they could accommodate small groups and get perhaps the same production that they will get from a big steel band. And I pointed out to him that we could have engaged the services of another dozen pan tuners also to assist Ellie Manet and Tony Williams and Bertie Marshall and we could have thought in terms of producing instruments, have these people producing instruments to be distributed at a subsidized cost to the various steel bands and so on. He did not accept my advice. And that fell true in spite of the fact that we had a lot of discussions on 
on this as to how we should go about with this research council, with these, these, these permanent pensioners and so on. So, while Dr. Williams, in my opinion, was a person I felt would have liked to see the Stevens make some progress, on the one hand. On the other, on the other hand, I don't think he really did, in the end, for the Stevens what he could have done. He could have done a lot. He was in a position to do a lot. I don't think he, he did what he, what, he could have, what he could have done at all. Um, But he, the steel band, is, the steel band, is, we, the steel band, we are not the only people who suffer in the country because of Dr. Williams not wanting to take advice. I don't think he, he took advice from anybody when, he, when things sportsmen past found themselves in a similar position. Other people who in other fields found themselves in similar positions and so on. Mm -hmm. um, there was a point I was making when you're... Right, with the, with the documentation. Oh, yeah, the documentation. Now... There, there are many versions. This is one of the things that I took up with Dr. Williams too. Many versions, published versions on the origin and history of the steel ban in Trinidad and Tobago. Antigua has got one version. And I, as everybody else know, Antigua jumped in the steel band business long after steel bands were well established in Trinidad and Tobago. But Antigua's got one version. Grenada, I understand, have one version. I think Ghana have one version. But in Trinidad, the birthplace of the steel band, the true birthplace of the steel band, we have mostly seven or eight different versions as to the origin and history of the steel band. We have a version written in a textbook that is being used in the secondary school, the name of the textbook, Language for Living. That is a lesson called The Birth of the Steel Band. This book is prepared by Gray, Cecil Gray and something Gilchrist. And in The Birth of the Steel Band, they gave one version. There's a school supervisor by the name of Silva Gonzalez who's got another version in a publication by the Ministry of Education and Culture. That textbook, that book is entitled um, Steel Band Saga. And Silva Gonzalez, she gave another version, different place, different time, different people, for what Gray and Gilchrist gave in the language for living. There's another version in a small book, I can't remember the name of that book now, written by Antony Eroff. He again gives a third version with respect to time, place, and people involved. In the Hummingbird magazine of 1962, I think it is, George Yates from Desbados, he gave a, another version, different place, different time, different people involved, and so on. The Warren Lion, the Calypsonian, he's got his own version, different place, different times, different everything. Dr. Errol Hill, I understand, he too has got his own version different time, different place, and so on. And perhaps Dr. J.D. Elder, he must be have his own version also. Now, while it is true that we can boast without any fear of contradiction that we are the steel band. And while we can prove this because in addition to having the gift to create the steel bands, we still maintain the best steel bands in the whole world. We still have the best steel bands in the whole world, on the one hand. We could not prove with documents to the satisfaction of anyone, with the exception of Trinidadians like ourselves, that Trinidad was the birthplace of the steel band because of the amount of virgins that we have been distributed all over the place. Now, I asked Dr. Williams sometime in the mid-1970s, long before they were asking him, and I'm hoping to prepare a document to George Chambers along the same lines. I feel that a high-powered commission 
should be appointed by the government to fully investigate the true origin and development of the steel ban and if we fully investigate the true origin and development of the steel ban we can only come up with one version as to how it started, where it started, when it started, why it started and so on. There are quite a number of people who were involved in the very early steel band, the Alexander Wachtein band for example, that are still alive and still far from being senile. I'm quite certain that the Commission can get valuable information from. Now if I am if I will be fifty eight years in the next few days and I don't know when this Taiwan started, how it started. You can well imagine, because I was too, I'm too young, you can well imagine what would be the age groups, age grouping of these people who would have an idea as to when it started, how it started, and why it started, and so on. These people more or less will be in the 70s. And when a person reaches the 70s, while I might die before a lot of people who are in the 70s, I can hardly see any person in the 70s, 70s going much further in life and so on. So I think that if we have to do this as quickly as possible before these people pass away. But we owe it to the world, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the steel bands. And I would like to say the people who are giving wrong information in an effort to perhaps bring fame to themselves or their friends or the district or the steel band from which they came. I will I would like to see that they think in terms of the bigger goal, think in terms of Trinidad or Tobago, think to forget whether it is started in Newton or Belmont or, or, or San Grande. Let us get the true story as to where it started. The important thing is that it started in Trinidad and a Trinidadian ought to feel proud that the steel band started in Trinidad whether it started in Sipari and he was living in Belmont, or whether it started in San Susi and he was living in Woodbrook. It, makes, it should make no difference. The important thing should be that it started in Trinidad with Trinidadians. Because if this is not done, we will continue to have the, the best steel bands in the whole world, but we will have no document that will be able to paint a picture to satisfy the world that steel band really started here not when there are documents by other countries like Antigua that is making claim that they started the steel bands in the in the country. There's one thing I'd like to see as far as documentation is concerned. And you have quite a few chaps who can take up from from the old people in the seventies might be able to talk from one the old people in, in the seventies might be able to talk and say what really took place in the early 30s and so on. But they would not be able to go too far down. You'll, you'll have to, they'll have to branch off some, somewhere along the lines of people like Ellie Manet and Rudolph Charles and Tony Williams and, and they will have to say what they know. Not, no, no one man doesn't know the, the complete history or the story of the steel band movement. You've got to get this information from a number of people. But these people must be, they must be truthful. They must be honest. They must not think in terms of, of, of any personal glory because of dramatizing some 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 one of the friends contribution and thing of a sort. This is what I like to see. Joe's got it. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. And um, your concerns are the same as mine and my colleagues and all the people that I have touched base with during my trek to attempt to document the evolution of Pan. Thanks again. Thank you very much. You're welcome any moment. My guest has been George Goddard, who has been a Pan man, uh, involved steel bandsman, uh, involved organizer of steel band organization here in Trinidad. This is Vaughn Martin.